This is the Digital Factory Podcast. I'm John Bruner. A few years ago, we started to see a remarkable explosion in hardware startups. This is remarkable because hardware is hard, especially if you're a small, newly formed company with not much money and not many people. But the companies that came out during this boom were taking advantage of what Chris Anderson called the peace dividends of the smartphone wars. In the process of creating inexpensive, powerful smartphones, the big electronics companies had created entire manufacturing and product development ecosystems that other companies were able to use. The big electronics companies left behind really inexpensive components, things like the MEMS devices in smartphones, really powerful mobile processors, great wireless communication systems, and of course, they opened the Chinese electronics manufacturing ecosystem and took full advantage of its creativity and efficiency. To someone who's been watching this area for a long time, it kind of looked like there was a bubble in hardware that peaked around maybe 2015. But the changes I just described are permanent, and even after the bubble, a new generation of careful, high-value hardware and robotics startups has arisen. Today we're going to talk about how those companies are working, how they got started, how they can take advantage of this ecosystem, how they can scale up, and we'll also talk about some of the special challenges that these types of electronics and robotics companies face as they're getting off the ground. But first, the Digital Factory podcast is brought to you by Formlabs, makers of accessible, precise, reliable 3D printers for the desktop and the benchtop. Learn more about how the Form 2 SLA printer and the Fuse 1 SLS printer can transform your prototyping and production workflows by visiting formlabs.com. My guest today is Eric Klein. Eric is a partner at Lemnos Labs, which is a venture fund that specializes in hardware. Eric, great to have you on. Hello. Thank you very much. So you have this terrific, broad, high-level view of what's going on in the world of hardware and sort of product development, and especially a sense of what startups are able to do today. So I'd love to get into some of that, and let's let's sort of begin with a quick introduction. What, what are some of the companies that you guys are working on these days? We have a, a pretty wide gamut of companies that we've worked with over the years in hardware. We've done everything from a bunch of work around drones, including companies like Airware and Series Imaging. So the classic flying you know, machine and what it does in terms of automation and the like. We've also done some companies doing interesting things with more basic aeronautic effects like Verez Engineering and, and companies like that. So drones is an area we've looked at. More recently, we've done a lot of work with applied robotics. And when I say applied, I mean the use of robotics to solve a singular task that is often very labor intensive. And so we have companies like company that was announced last week, Built Robotics, that's you, basically they've automated a bobcat so that they can do excavation. So single family home and small building excavations done completely via an automated bobcat system. We've also have other companies looking at last mile deliveries. So robots that roll along the streets. We have another team that's Marble. We have another team, FarmWise, that's working on robotics for agriculture and in particular for organic farming. So applied robotics is an area. We've also done advanced manufacturing. And by that, I mean things like carbon fiber automation. That's a company that we invested in called Seraforge that basically weaves and looms 3D in 3D carbon fiber. We also did a laser metal sintering company in Matterfab. We love advanced manufacturing. We've done some consumer, a company, Tephoria, and a lot of enterprise and industrial IoT. Hmm. So right across the board, there's very few things that we won't invest in and we see a lot of, you know, the great startups coming through the hardware ecosystem. So that is a terrifically broad range of uh, companies that are in your portfolio. And in my mind, I sort of informally divide them into a couple of categories as they relate to this idea of digital manufacturing. Some of these companies like Matterfab and the, the efforts around carbon fabrication are actually digital fabrication technologies in themselves. Other of these companies are uh, not necessarily manufacturing oriented, but they take advantage of sort of the modern product development processes that are available to, you know, any company, whether it's a startup or a really giant company. So I wonder if we could sort of take these separately, you know, and widely speaking, uh, if you could sort of talk about what's available to these startups today that wasn't available a few years ago that they can use in developing these really sophisticated products. 
Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. As an example, Seraforge, uh, when you talk about it, you know, at manufacturing, they are automating and moving the art forward tremendously on creating complex carbon fiber preforms. At the same time, they have to build out their own ability to manufacture parts. And so they have to build complex machines and factories to, you know, build their own machines, which then put out parts. I think it's a really neat thing that's happening. I see a lot of the exact same thing in happening in, in applied robotics. The thing that when people look at our portfolio, they're like, I don't understand how these things fit together. How do you get these companies to work together? Underneath it, you see so many common technologies around, you know, computer vision systems, right? Open CV, linear actuation, right? Whether I'm, you know, running across a gantry to manufacture something or robotics, PLC, there's so many things that are going on that, that have facilitated these type of companies. Obviously, battery technology, SOC, sort of core technologies, camera, right? The camera technology. There's all these arcs of technology that have come forward the last few years mm -hmm. that have unlocked new technology. I think in the same way that four or five years ago, we had this just renaissance of consumer electronic devices. As Chris Anderson likes to say, right, it's the benefits of the smartphone revolution. Another revolution that happened, I think, that unlocked is when we got a significant reduction in the cost of, again, electric motors, mm -hmm. um, brushless motors, a whole bunch of uh, technologies, again, around actualization and sensors really unlocked robotics, whereas a, a system including a robotic arm, some actuation, some movement, those used to be hundreds of thousands of dollars. And now we can build those robots for, you know, 20, 30, 50, $60,000. Hmm. It changes the economics of the underlying businesses that they can put robots in. So if you look at the embedded processing that you mentioned a second ago, it's clear that that comes from the mobile phone supply chain. Where is this uh, incredible development in robotics coming from? So I think a couple of things that, that happen, as an example, when you look at um, drone technology, just the, over the last few years, as an example, if you wanted brushless electric motors five or 10 years ago, and especially in larger sizes, those were the domains of very, very specialized devices. But all of a sudden, we've got electric cars, we have drones going in volume, it's sort of lower volume. So across the spectrum, demand, and I'm just using electric motors as an example, mm -hmm. demand increased for both you know larger uses and small uses and any time that you get this massive surge in volume you get a decrease in the cost of those devices and you get a, a wider diversity of options available to you so we have companies in our portfolio in our drone space that weren't really possible just a couple of years ago because they couldn't have acquired the quality and the quantity of motors that they wanted mm -hmm. it's sort of a again it's a it's a loop as as we get more applications more vendors come in to fulfill the increased need and at some point you hit critical mass and I think for robotics and aerospace and some other areas, we've hit that mass where, mm -hmm. again, I can go on to Alibaba or I can go to, you know, some specialized sources. And now I have plenty of choices and I can, you know, I've got everything from order quantity 100 up to order quantity 100,000 in sort of any size or shape you need. So a lot of what we saw with SOCs and sensors maybe five, six years ago now I think is coming to play in movement, uh, propulsion, movement, vision systems. And those are the, you know, you know, those are the building blocks of, of robotics. So how has the experience of implementing these technologies changed? I mean, what, one of the things that strikes me is that a lot of these companies operate in fields that, you know, 20 years ago would have been dominated by big conventional engineering companies like Boeing, not like, you know, four young people with a startup in an incubator. Uh, what is it that makes it possible? In robotics, there's a big jump point that has really facilitated a lot of teams. And I'm going to say it's both a, a yin and a yang. It's both a good and, and maybe there's some challenges in it, which is the use of ROS or the robot operating system. Mm -hmm. So the great thing about robotics is, if I, as I talked about the hardware side, how you know there there have been many unlocks in terms of hardware accessibility to build robot systems of all different types. Right. Ross gives almost every team who wants to jump into uh, into robotics or applied robotics a good base camp to start from. Um, it's years of work in academia and companies ported across almost all major Intel, Qualcomm, SOCs. If there's an arm, there's a module for it. If there's a sensor system, there's often a module for it. So companies have a jump point to quickly bring up systems. The challenge is, you know, at the same time with Ross, and this points to where we are in the maturity of the robotics revolution is, is that Ross really came from academic roots. And what we see right now is a lot of commercial companies starting to use it, <laughs> but going, hey, there's challenges here, there's challenges there. 
and they're taking the approach initially of doing closed loop forks, right? They're not necessarily checking back in. Ross doesn't have as strong of a central body as maybe more mature software stacks over time like MySQL and Linux and others got to. But we're at the beginnings where, again, hardware's been unlocked, uh, software's been unlocked. And then, of course, you know, you could layer on that the general improvements in in terms of logistics and 4PL and, mm-hmm. okay, once I have a robot, how do I get it into the field? And if I need parts shipped from here or there, every company that's building hardware has, has benefit from just the overall global supply chain becoming uh, not only more efficient and more diverse, but just so much easier to access, right? So much of it is now a web form away or, or a, a web process or a REST API away from being used. So we have these handful of things that you mentioned here, access to the global supply chain, the beginnings of the open source embedded software movement, other kinds of areas where you see open source hardware coming out, a lot of uh, you know decreased prices of sensors and onboard computing. So all of this you know comes down to sort of accessibility and uh, accessibility to different kinds of expertise. So what kinds of teams are you seeing developing these products? Are they the conventional hardware development teams where you have a lot of like deep embedded systems engineers, or do you see more generalists kind of crossing the boundaries of disciplines? I think this is the hardest challenge of building a hardware company. I always say, and and it's a little dramatic, but you get the first 10 employees are are nine clones of the founder, Mm -hmm. and you can be incredibly successful at that, right? And you need software developers and you need a bunch of them. And then at some point you need to scale operations and sales around that software team. But if you look at the first 10 hires of a hardware company, you can have seven different disciplines represented in the first 10 employees. And by the time you're out at 20, we've added more disciplines. So imagine I'm I'm building a robotics company today or an advanced manufacturing company because they have so many genetic pieces that are exactly the same, right? Mm -hmm. I am immediately hiring mechanical engineers and electrical engineers, and I'm hiring mechatronics engineers, folks who sort of play in the middle of those two things, right? At the same time, I got firmware folks who are, who are driving the PLCs and, and all the embedded systems. And now those robots are doing things. And let's say, for instance, that robot is, let's say it's a manufacturing robot and it's interfacing with SolidWorks, you mm-hmm. know, or SolidWorks and the Autodesk suites and all of these different things. Now I need software engineers to build sort of the CAM interfaces to it. And that machine is throwing off a tremendous amount of really important data. So I have analytics engineers looking at the massive amount of telemetry that comes off of these advanced manufacturing machines or applied robots. And then, of course, and that's just on the engineering side. So I I have every known sort of hardware discipline. The minute I want to build more than one of them, I've got to bring up a, a hardware operations team. And in the case of, let's say I'm building a new manufacturing machine or I'm building a new applied robot. It's not necessarily like I can go to Foxconn and say, hey, Foxconn, I need you to build thousands and thousands of these robots of which there have never been one before, right? So even necessarily approaching a traditional, you know, consumer electronics CM, you might not be able to do that. You may need to build your manufacturing capability in-house for a while and potentially for a long while. You may end up looking like intuitive surgical, right, where you build your own robots. And so now, in addition to all that hardware expertise I built, all that software and firmware expertise, all that back-end expertise I built in terms of server infrastructure and data analytics, I built out a full operations team and I built a full logistics team. And then, by the way, I have to sell it. Mm -hmm. So I need to build out a sales organization that's appropriate to the type of customer I'm selling to. Mm -hmm. That could be government and, and educational, which is one type of sales. It could be to large enterprises. That's another one. It could be that my robot goes into every restaurant in America in the back end, right? It, it, it does something amazing. And if it does that, then I've got to figure out how to sell to, you know, thousands and thousands of businesses. <laughs> Sorry, long-winded way of saying, I always think that, that, that the biggest challenge of starting a hardware company is that you're building a complex systems company that you have to hire so many diverse people to get to market. And that may be the biggest challenge. It's not technology. It's not necessarily capital dollars. It's the people and the diversity of people that you need to bring together as a team to execute these complex systems. Right. So the barriers are coming down. It's easier than ever to do this. In fact, it's sometimes possible for a single individual or two people to come up with the very first prototype of something. But then actually bringing a product to market is still enormously complex and requires a lot of different kinds of expertise. You nailed it. That is the paradox of hardware, which is it's never been easier to make hardware. It hasn't gotten a lot easier to actually go to scale 
and sell it, right? And to, to bring the product to market at scale, that that is the challenge of hardware. Right. It brings to mind a discussion that you and I have had um, a few times. Eric and I run into each other uh, periodically in sort of the hardware scene, and we often uh, wind up talking about how the maker movement relates to this hardware and electronics renaissance that we've seen in the last few years. And, and in some ways, you know, they share similar roots, but it has really become clear that these are two completely separate communities with completely separate sets of instincts. Yeah, I think it's, it's re- and you and I have talked about this, I think it's really easy to use this word maker and try to smear it across the entirety of, of the hardware renaissance. And I think the challenge in it is, is that inside the hardware renaissance, we have sort of multiple springs of innovation or multiple revolutions going on, right? Inside of STEM, there's so many great things where we're teaching an entire generation to, to take things apart and put things together and, and to be comfortable with the physical world as much as they are with the digital world. And then we have this whole great movement, which I think sometimes encompasses the word maker more than any other, which is this ability because it, the accessibility of the entire hardware development chain has, has become so much easier, that accessibility is there, that we're seeing this just wealth of new I'm going to call them simpler or consumer products, singular products that, that are wonderful products. I love buying them. And then at the, at the top end, that same revolution has opened up massive opportunities for large, complex systems to be built at the edge of technology where the technology wasn't even available to us five years ago. Mm-hmm. But those complex systems require that diversity of hiring and that larger capital pool that maybe means that if they do fit into the word make, they are at the very, very high end, but it's almost its own special area. And each of them are worthy of attention and innovation. I struggle to put them under the same, under one moniker, under one word, because they, they really are very different. They feed each other. They have touch points, but I, I, don't, I don't know that it's necessarily a continuum. It's it's much more very discrete step function. Right, right. It seems like, you know, they, they enjoy uh, the benefits of some of the same trends, the, the decreasing cost of components, the accessibility of tools, the introduction of uh, new systems for prototyping, like, you know, 3D printing and desktop CNC and uh, digital design software. But uh, it's really a, a separate set of people and a separate set of projects. And I think that's something that the 3D printing industry certainly discovered uh, when there was a great deal of hype around 3D printing for consumers about five years ago. And, you know, it, it wasn't borne out. And now the industry has to sort of reestablish its credibility with professionals. There's a lot of interesting stuff going on in 3D printing and in the introduction of 3D printing to sort of traditional manufacturing processes, really sophisticated stuff. You know, the industry kind of has to keep proving itself to the professionals who think, well, this is a, a maker kind of field. I agree with you. I think there's some interesting, you know, I, some of the tools, as an example, in, in my shop, I have some of the same tools, right? We're, we're about ready to get a form labs printer and we have traditional 3D printing here and a laser cutter and all those things. And you'll find those same things in a, in a maker space and you'll find them, you know, in the, in the prototyping phase, you use the same tooling. The interesting thing that my companies have to do is there's a jump at some point where we have to say, all right, now I need to make 400 of these items or 500 mm-hmm. or 5,000, right? And, and there's step functions and, and we may need increased fidelity, right? So we go from, you know, just traditional coming off of our lulls bot and we're like, okay, and then I'm to the form labs. And then I'm like, all right, now I need a factory and I need a bunch of them coordinated together <laughs> so that I can make a lot more of these. And so it's that step function in terms of fidelity and quantity that maybe, as, again, as you start to hit volume, as you hit scale, you have to start to go through those things. I think one of the neat things that's happened, um, and, and this is where it, you, know, you see, you know, while it's step functions, there's, there's a lot of parallels, is when, as an example, for my enterprise hardware companies, a lot of times when you think of you know, manufacturing, you think of doing sort of low fidelity prototypes, high fidelity prototypes, and then you immediately go to the steel cut tools, you go cut a bunch of tools, and then you build thousands and thousands of them. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. For consumer products, that's often the case, but in the enterprise customers, they just want the data coming from the object that they're buying. They look at the hardware they're buying as more of as a, as a service, you know, ass, whatever, put the first letter in front of it, but as a service. 
Mm -hmm. And so fidelity on the hardware and the casing and all of that, Mm -hmm. they're willing to accept lower fidelity and maybe higher field failure rates and stuff initially if it's fulfilling in general what they want. And then as we dial in the feature set and and as the enterprise customers are happy, then we in turn increase quantity and fidelity and quality and all of those other things. So in the enterprise space, a lot of our companies use the upper end of the scale of of prototyping platforms to get to customers and deploy in field as opposed to cutting tools and and making thousands and thousands right away they'll in pilots with with enterprise customers they'll make high hundreds using scale with prototyping tools and then only when we know we've got it right do we turn around and lock down the design and 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 jump into more traditional manufacturing techniques yeah that that's something that has astonished me in the last couple of years to see uh, what had previously been thought of as prototyping tools, making it into sort of small and mid-run manufacturing processes. So um, there was a, a talk at the Digital Factory Conference back in June from an executive at Jabil, which is one of the big contract manufacturers, who explained that uh, 3D printing and, and basically desktop FDM machines in particular are widely used on Jabil lines to create not just enclosures, but also a lot of internal components, things where the surface finish isn't that important and where you might benefit from being able to to sort of retool at low cost. And that many products that they manufacture have some 3D printed parts in them. Sometimes the end user doesn't even realize that these are uh, 3D printed and maybe the engineers or the, or the designers didn't have in mind that this could be 3D printed. But uh, the, the break-even points now between 3D printing and injection molding have gotten so high that you can do runs of, you know, over 10,000 of some kinds of parts on 3D printing, you know, on, on FDM machines before you reach the break even with injection molding. So you're seeing these like prototyping tools start to work their way up the stack into even mid run production. Absolutely. And I always say, you know, two things about that. Number one is that the customer doesn't care. Mm hmm. Right. They, 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 they really don't. They just want what the what the function of the object is. And so, again, especially in a service model where they're just paying X dollars a month for what the output of that object is, whether it's data or intelligence or actuation or whatever it is. They're paying for that, so they don't care how they get the you know the output. So I can replace that machine regularly. So even if I'm using lower fidelity parts, the customer doesn't care. Mm-hmm. Um, I can I can go back in time and replace the machine with a better version of the machine as long as the data output stays the same or improves. The other thing that that has really impressed us is not necessarily. I think everybody focuses on the machine the 3D printing machines, the the improvements in CNC and other things. The thing that's blown us away is the improvement in materials. Hmm. Um, what I can run through the machine, which facilitates parts coming out with higher durability or higher stress tolerances or characteristics that we needed that five years ago we just couldn't get a machine to, you know, to additively manufacture with, with a material like that. So as material science is moving forward and we're able to feed the machine different materials for different parts and quickly switch between them all of a sudden more of the machine uh more of the you know of the product that we're trying to make we can do via 3d manufacturing right you can even do uh, injection molding on 3d printed molds exactly obviously it's not going to come out the same way as with hard tooling but uh you know, this gets you over a, a huge hump in the process. Right. I, I don't necessarily have to cut a soft tool, right? I can I can use a, a 3D printed part to, to do my molding. This is something five years ago that was, you know, maybe state of the art. Maybe it was in a research facility and maybe, you know, a, a large manufacturer had it. But now we, we at, at the, you know, at the startup level have access to that. And so we can do more of of our production using additive manufacturing at scale. Again, I, it's not making one, I need to make tens, hundreds, low thousands of them before again, I get to the point where I'm, I've dialed in the product. I know what the customer wants, and then I can look at other ways to potentially lower cost at higher volume in manufacturing using again, other techniques, but no, it it has definitely changed the way we think about it. I, uh, my, our lab is our, our our tool shop is physically limited space wise, and I always say that 
uh, like my, my poor little Tormach gets get, keep getting pushed in the corner because <laughs> I have to constantly buy, I'm, you know, the big demand for us is to buy more varied capability 3D or additive printing capability um, because with these new materials, my teams just want more jobs on the beds all the time. They're like, I, I need, I need more beds and more jobs running. Right. Um, because you know they're able to prototype and low vol manufacture more and more of the parts that they assemble using those techniques than either subtractive or uh, mass manufacturing techniques. So you've used this phrase a couple of times, uh, dialing in the product, which is a really interesting idea and a striking thing to hear when you're talking about hardware. You know, in, in software, we appreciate that uh, you can update and, and continually improve your product after it's in the marketplace. But in hardware, uh, not only can you not change hardware that's already out there, but for the reasons that we've been talking about, the tooling costs and, uh, and, the, and the supply chain organization, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, tweak the design of a product once it's in manufacturing. So uh, this is a really interesting idea that, you know, that dialing in the product as you're developing it is, is something you can do now with hardware because the manufacturing processes are becoming more flexible. Yeah, this is something where, again, five, six years ago, I would have had a different position. And I, I always used to say, you know, when we build hardware, it's where Agile and Waterfall slam into each other, right? Where <laughs> hardware was, you build it once, and by the way, it goes out in the field and it doesn't change for a while. And so you you use a waterfall process on it, and it's, 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 it's a lockdown, right? As you're going from prototyping to EVT to DV to PV. And I think what disrupted that over the last five years is a change in the economics or the or the or the business model associated with certain segments. So I think that in the case of a phone, right, especially today, right, these sealed phones, it is true. Once you get an mm -hmm. iPhone or you get your Pixel 2, that's the phone you got. It's sort of locked down. You're not opening it up and changing anything. But in the enterprise segment and other segments, what you're seeing is, is again, rather than you buying a physical right. object and that's the object forever, what you're buying is a service that is provided by the, by the product. So this box that you put on your factory line that is watching a motor or watching a process and streaming a bunch of data back, the, that customer is paying for the data that the box is providing. So if month to month I say, you know what, I could, uh, a ch we've had a change in sensor technology and I can get higher mm -hmm. fidelity data. I can literally, because the customer is paying me every month as a service for the data, I just walk over to that box, you know, briefly bring it offline, snap in a new box. And the economics of, of, of that new, you know, paying for the bomb of that new box is covered in the service fee. Mm -hmm. And the customer doesn't care. They just want data and then they want better data and they want more data and they want more things that Im positively impact their business. Now hardware is this malleable object. And, and I don't think of it necessarily as being this one-off that goes out in the field, sits there forever and, uh, and does one job. It's more of this thing that I, I, I'm refreshing and uh, iterating on. Now that's mm -hmm. not, this isn't a universal truth and it's not that every scenario is that way, but more cases of this are occurring where the customer wants an output and it's my job to get them that. I mean, I, I love that line that, that what is it, Bo or Boeing and jet engine manufacturers, they sell, th they don't, they don't sell you an engine. They sell thrust as a service. Right. It does a nice job of aligning the incentives because if the, uh, you know, the OEM has to create equipment that uh, that it is going to maintain indefinitely going forward. I love this idea because it's like, a, and I'll continue that analogy, it's like if I improve the engine significantly and I make it more efficient, I can either improve my margins of what I offered thrust as a service for, or I can say to the customer, hey, since you were buying thrust as a service, why don't I, I can offer you an upgrade? Like I've, I've tweaked this and I can give you you know, 10% more fuel efficiency. Let's talk about the agreement around that. And so you start to think of, of hardware more dynamically than ever. I, I would never, again, I, I always love to caveat what I say. I would never use this as an excuse to say that, that hardware has become hyper agile. It hasn't. You still mm -hmm. develop hardware differently, but we have more flexibility in how we think about it than we had five years ago, for sure. 
The other thing that, uh, that of course, makes it flexible is that so many of these devices are internet connected and they're running, um, you know, a full operating system, some kind of Linux usually, that means that it's, uh, it's, it's pretty easy to do over the air updates. The, the Nest is a famous example of a consumer electronics uh, product that, you know, picks up new features over time as it kind of downloads new embedded operating system uh, versions and, and keeps sort of exposing new capabilities. And this must be something you see in the industrial space as well. Oh, absolutely. Enterprise, industrial, it, you know, and I always say to my teams as they start building their product, don't forget the telemetry. It's easy to go, ah, you know, I, I don't really need all that data or anything. But early on, your system is a learning environment, right? You're pulling tremendous amounts of data, not only about, you know, what you're affecting or what you're instrumenting, but the internals of the device itself. What is it doing? Because in telling me what it's doing, you know, it's, it's thermals, it, the amount of compute, where the compute is going, you know, what percentage of time I'm doing this versus that, how many actuations of this are going on. Mm-hmm. And early on as a startup, you need to do that because that's how you tune. That's how you reduce the bomb. That's how you improve your efficiency of the product is just by letting the product tell you what it's doing. <laughs> Now we'll move on to our uh, new recurring segment called Tools, where we ask our guest about a favorite tool, and it could be anything from, uh, you know, a benchtop tool, something very serious, to uh, something sort of uh, unexpected or trivial. So, Eric Klein, tell us about your favorite tool. (laughs) I have so many tools, but the thing I've been on a quest for recently, and and this is a historical quest that I can go back in time and come all the way to the day, is... I have been on a, on a quest to replace pen and paper. Hmm. Pen and paper is, is one of the most beautiful and eloquent, you know, tools we've ever invented. Uh, ever since I was a, you know, a student in school, I've always carried around books and I write my thoughts and I have a whole bookshelf logged of, of, you know, the classic engineering notebooks. But what I realized over the years is you're always, you know, the, the challenge with pen and paper is you're always like, I remember at some point, like a year ago, I had this great idea or I had a conversation with somebody And recall in paper is really difficult. I end up opening five different books and trying to figure Mm -hmm. out when it, because you, you you have this loose temporal nature to your data. You're like, eh, I sort of remember. It wasn't like (laughs) a year ago. It was really three, but then you got to open up three years worth of books. No good search function for books. So I actually, you know, in, in previous incarnations, I worked at Apple during the development of the Newton. I went to Palm, um, on this quest. Uh, and, and I think we made great strides, but we never quite slayed the paper and pen beast. And so most recently, I, I have been looking at things like the, the Microsoft Surface. And mm-hmm. the tool that I've, I've migrated to is, is the Apple iPad and the Pencil. And the tool mm-hmm. that I highlight is the Pencil itself. For the first time, I, 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 I'm able to take notes with the fidelity and, and close to the feeling that I have with pen and paper. And, and most importantly, I'm getting better at recall. I think we have a lot of improvements still to do in terms of being able to parse through those notes. But if you look at things like OneNote and Evernote, when married with a pen and a digital system, it's the first time where I've started to travel on trips and say, all right, I would rather have my digital form of of capture than my paper form. And uh, I don't think we're quite there yet. I, I still carry a small notebook and a pen. It's like the break glass in emergency when I'm just frustrated at when I've hit the edge of digital, what digital can do. But I think we're tantalizingly close to really being able to do what, to get that feeling, to get that sense of just rapid capture. I don't think when I capture, I just write as fast as I can. I draw as fast as I can. My pages are covered with arrows and drawings and, and so my goal has always been to try to, to be able to recall that. And, and I think that the thing that I would, I would encourage people to do is even if you maybe played with some stuff a couple of years ago, it's another area where technology has really leapt forward. Um, and again, I'm, I'm agnostic. I've, I've looked at the Windows thing. I really like it. I've looked at the Apple thing. I probably like it just a touch more. Um, but we seem to be getting close to being able to 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 uh, to relegating pen and paper to, uh, to to the bookshelf. I don't know where it goes, <laughs> but uh, at least in my daily life, being able to finally have true digital recall. Um, if I could just find a way to recall all the 20 years worth of books I've already made with pen and paper, my life would be complete. I am also a user of the uh, 
Apple Pencil with an iPad, and um, I it 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 gives you a good sense of um, how much of a difference different really tiny sort of design decisions within apps can make. You mentioned uh, Evernote and OneNote. I, I've used both of those with the pencil. They treat uh, kind of the paper that you're drawing on in slightly different ways. I've wound up preferring OneNote. Um, which which app do you use with the pencil? You know, uh, and it's it's funny. This is I agree with you. The software is still the key, and the inconsistency at a platform level. I, as an example, on on a, on an iPad, if you want to import into Evernote, you end up having to you you draw in penultimate, mm-hmm. and then penultimate sort of Hoover is hoovered up by Evernote. Whereas on the Windows platform, on a Surface Pen, it's direct, and it I, I like I like those things. And again, how they treat like different brushes or pen types and all of that. I haven't found a lot of consistency there. So that's where, again, there, there are times where I'm doing things. And, you know, the concept of what page is it on and things, I think they haven't gotten all that quite right yet. And that's where, again, you, you just occasionally I'll, I'll, I'll be on a jag and I'll be on my, my, with my pencil and my iPad for a couple of days. And then I just grab a good composition notebook and a, and a pen and I'm just like... Oh, it feels so good. <laughs> so we're tantalizingly close to mimicking that, but we haven't quite got there. But I, I do I do encourage everybody. I think there's been such a, a leap forward in just the last few years, both with Apple's improvements with the iPad Pro and the Pencil and what you've seen in the in the Windows platform with Surface and Surface Pen. Uh, and the pen technology associated with it, that it's definitely worth if you if you looked at it a few years ago and you're like, eh, low fidelity doesn't quite re- you know retrieve what I was was trying to to achieve. Um, go back and take a look. You'll you'll find a lot of improvement, and you may find that they've crossed the threshold for you. Eric, it's been a pleasure speaking with you today. If listeners want to find you online, where should they look? We are at uh, Lemnos L E M N O S dot V C. And on the Twitters, I am at Sir Coolio, S-I-R-C-O-O-L-I-O. That's a great Twitter handle. Was that also like your AIM uh, username? Yeah, I am. Um, by way of backstory, many years ago, I helped start a little game company called Bungie, um, which went on to make the Halo universe. And so, uh, yes, that, that is my, that's the, my very old game handle, and that has never left me. Excellent. Eric, thank you so much for talking today. Thank you. The Digital Factory podcast is presented by Formlabs. The Form 2 is Formlabs' best-selling desktop stereolithography 3D printer. It enables anyone to create intricate designs and functional prototypes in a wide variety of materials right from their desk. The new Fuse 1 is a benchtop selective laser sintering 3D printer that makes robust parts out of nylon with efficient part packing and total geometric freedom. Learn about both the Form 2 and the Fuse 1 at formlabs.com. With the Digital Factory, I'm John Bruner.